This is Kyle Cleveland with the Institute of Contemporary Asian Studies at Temple University of Japan's ICAST. And I'm talking today with Stefan Dejarek, who is the spokesman for the Secretary General of the United Nations. Steph, you're in New York. Thank you for taking the time to talk today. My pleasure, Kyle. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Steph, I know of you through Robert, your brother, Robert Dejarek, who for a number of years has been the director of Temple University's Institute here. And if you could speak a little bit about your history with the United Nations and how you became involved in this role. Sure. So uh, I've been at the United Nations for about 20 years now, uh, serving solely in communications capacities. I came to the UN in sort of a roundabout uh, way. Uh, after finishing my university degree in the US, I returned to France, uh, tried to get into journalism, wound up working for ABC News, uh, the US television network. I worked for them in uh, for about nine years, two years in Paris, three years in London, and then four years in New York. And throughout that time, I did a lot of traveling, covering some of the major stories that broke in the 1990s, whether it's the, the war in the Eastern Congo, Somalia, the former Yugoslavia. And I always had come across uh, UN uh, staffers and UN people, and I've I was attracted to what they were doing, uh, but never really pursued it actively. And uh, in late 1999, a colleague of mine at ABC said, you know, there's a job opening at the UN uh, for assistant spokesperson, you should apply. And I applied kind of on a, on, on a, on a whim, was fortunate enough to, to get the job. And I, I joined the UN in May of 2000, uh, working for Fred Eckhart, who was the then spokesman for the late Secretary General uh, Kofi Annan. Um, and Fred retired in 2005. Uh, this was at some of the, the, the nadir of the UN's reputation and relations with the US. It was after the Iraq war, a number of accusations were being made on corruption against the UN. And, and I think they couldn't find anyone with a reputation to take the job. So uh, I was fortunate enough to take a risk. I had nothing to lose. Um, and then for there, I served Kofi Annan for two years uh, until he left, uh, he left office. And it was uh, an amazing time, amazing opportunity. Ban Ki-moon came in in early 2007, the Secretary General uh, from, Seventh Secretary General from the, the Republic of Korea, as you know, you know well. Uh, <clears throat> I was uh, asked to find another post at that time because understandably he came in with another team. And I went to the UN Development Program, and then I worked, went back to the Secretariat and headed up the UN's television and internet uh, services. And in 2014, um, Ban Ki-moon's spokesman said he wanted to leave, and my boss at the time said, do you know anyone who could replace him? And so I gave him a few names, and I went home that evening, and I told my, my wife what had happened, and she hit me over the head with a newspaper, and I think more figuratively than literally. Um, and she said, why didn't you give him your name? So I went back the next day, and I did just that. And I said, you know, I could walk into the job. I know the press corps. And so Ban Ki-moon hired me. I finished out his term through uh, the end of, uh, of 2016. And uh, I did not expect to stay. But when Antonio Guterres came in as the uh, eighth secretary general, uh, he decided to keep me on. And I've been... Um, I've been here ever since, and it's been uh, an immense privilege uh, to do this job. And I think privilege is the word that I keep using because it truly is a, a, a privilege to be able to serve the United Nations and to have served three secretaries general who were all uh, very unique and very powerful in their own ways. It seems like a job that's so complex. The United Nations is so multifaceted. How are you able to manage this kind of workload where you're representing the institutional interest of the UN, but you're dealing with all these various member states and the issues that they're facing at a given time? Well, it's, it's a very good question. And, you know, my job is to speak for just one slice of the UN, right? The Secretary General, who represents the Secretariat. I don't speak for the Security Council, the General Assembly. I don't speak for UNICEF, the World Health Organization. But that being said, the, the UN's communications challenge is very great. And that's because we have 
on one hand, the world's most recognizable logo. I mean, I think you'd go just about anywhere and you show them the logo and they would, people would say, oh, that's the UN. But we have no brand management. You know, if you take um, uh, Sony or Panasonic or McDonald's, it's always very clear uh, who gets to speak for that brand. For the UN, by design, many, many people get to speak for that on behalf of the UN whether it's the president of the Security Council, a special rapporteur on human rights, the president of the General Assembly, uh, the head of UNICEF, they're always tied to the UN. Yet the person that embodies the UN, and that's the secretary general, is often held responsible for many of the actions of people over which he has no authority over. And so the, the result is that all too often, the negative narrative about the UN is very simple. But to turn that narrative around to a positive one or to even a neutral one takes some extra time in unpacking and explaining to people what the UN is and often, more importantly, what the UN is not. If the negative narrative on, on the United Nations is simplistic, what, what is it? What is the reduction there? Well, you know, on, on one hand, people who criticize, who fear, who, who see the UN and as, as an all-powerful, you know, world government, uh, which is not. I mean, the, 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 you have to realize the Secretary General, if you look at the Charter, has basically no authority. He is the head of the, the Secretariat, um, but it's an organization of sovereign member states. And so the... The negative narrative is when the, the nations that make up the UN are disunited, right? The, mm -hmm. let, let's take Syria, for example. So people say, well, the UN has failed the people of Syria. My, my, the way I have to answer the question is, is ask a question in, in, in return. What UN are you talking about? If you're talking about the Security Council, it's clear that the Security Council has lacked any sort of real unity on pushing uh, Syria towards peace. Um, if you are talking about the Secretary General, I would argue, no. The Secretary General has not, uh, even though, let me put it this way, even though there has been no political unity in the Security Council, it has not stopped the UN's humanitarian workers of being there on the front lines, never abandoning the people of Syria. It has not stopped the UN's uh, political envoy for Syria for keeping, you know, for continuing to put all his efforts into reaching a peace deal. But we all know that it will require a real, a real deal on Syria or on Libya or on Yemen will require strong unity from the Security Council and the most powerful members of the Security Council. Unfortunately, the UN is, or fortunately, you could say, the UN is a reflection of the world that we live in. So we are in a world where great power relations are not in a good place, to put it mildly. And that impacts how they behave and how they vote within the UN and especially within the Security Council. Well, it seems the United Nations is inherently political. And I don't know how to talk about politics except in a somewhat critical way. So how are you able to speak to these issues without resorting to platitudes or vagaries that don't really address those critiques? How are you able to take on this criticism that may be coming we, on an array we, of various issues? We, we take it on by showing what the UN is doing. You know, when, uh, mm -hmm. when the, the, the UN is doing airdrops in eastern Syria in Deir Zor because the parties can't agree to a ceasefire, that's the UN of the working, and that's the UN as uh, under the authority of the Secretary General working, right? Uh, mm -hmm. It's uh, World Health Organization and UNICEF uh, staffers doing measles a vaccination in the middle of war zones. Uh, it's peacekeeping troops uh, trying to keep the peace uh, in some of the most dangerous areas in the world, whether it's in Mali or the Central African Republic. Uh, it's the UN being on the ground and serving people. It's the UNHCR, you know, the UN Refugee Agency, uh, providing shelter 
and food for millions of refugees around the world who otherwise would be abandoned. That's the UN that uh, that works. Uh, but the UN is also so you, it, it is inherently political, but there's a whole normative side of the UN as well, right? Whether it's on the human rights side or whether it's in more specialized areas like world health, telecommunications, uh, international civil aviation travel, maritime travel. There's a whole business, so to speak, business part of the UN that enables the global economic machine to work, right? I mean, for, for plane for a Japanese plane to be able to land safely in uh, in Kinshasa, there has to be a common language for civil aviation. Where was that language elaborated? At the International Civil Aviation Organization. Same thing for letters, right? I mean, for, if the, the, the Japan, Japan, if you mail a letter in, uh, in Yokohama and send it to your family in the U.S., it's because there were treaties negotiated under the International Postal Union. It's not the sexy part of the UN, but it's the part of the UN that's indispensable in a globalized world. You've been with the United Nations long enough that you've been able to live through some very historic events. And probably the nature of the world these days is it seems like every few years there is a singularly historic event, starting back with the Gulf War at about the time that you first came in. So how have you seen the United Nations mission or its actions evolving over time in response to these various historic crises? Whatever happens, the UN winds up at the center of the center of things in, in terms of preventing conflict. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. I mean, it didn't. The UN uh, architecture, the Security Council, did not prevent conflict uh, during the Iraq War. Right? Uh, other places, conflicts uh, were either prevented or or minimized. Uh, I think. During each one of these crises, it, it is a reminder of why the UN exists. Even if you were going to strip away all the humanitarian work, all the normative work, you will always need a place, a convening place where nations can come and talk. Um, it sounds idealistic and basic, but it is a fact. You will always need that table around which 193 countries can come in and, and talk. I mean, you look, you look at the, the current pandemic that we're in, you look at issues mm -hmm. of climate change, you, you need this place, you, you need a table that's already existing. You know, when you talk about the UN, you're not gonna need talks about talks. You're not gonna have to negotiate the size of the table, the shape of the table, it's there. And so that, that is the, the, the remains the unique and central role of the United Nations, even if you were going to strip everything else. With the current COVID crisis, which seems to be just uh, so profoundly influential on every nation, are there any analogies to this, or do you see this as being a, a singular event? I, I think the only thing that would seem to be comparable would be a major world war. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a singular event. I, I don't. Uh, it's a singular event because. It's a it's it's a war without bloodshed, but it's a war with that. Well, no blood is being spilled. I mean, people are dying, but no blood is being spilled. It has economic, uh, a, a devastating economic impact. Um, no bombs are falling, uh, but economies are being destroyed. And I think what it what it uh, what it shows you is that you need this place uh, where. You know, the World Health Assembly, where people can come around, uh, can get honest, uh, honest advice and clear scientific advice on the World Health Organization. I think, unfortunately, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier about the UN not being isolated and a reflection of the world we live in, we're seeing a politicization of global health policy. And that is a reflection of the state of play of relations between the U.S. and China and 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 others, mm -hmm. and that's that's uh, that's too bad. Well, you've been through this before, somewhat through SARS and H one N one, the swine flu. This is obviously at a much larger scale, yeah. but were those issues politicized in this way? Not, not, I mean, not that I recall, and they were not as global. Uh, I, I think this is un, this is unprecedented because 
layered on, you know, on, on top of a global health crisis, you have a, a crisis of relations between uh, some of the world's largest uh, powers, and you have a level of instability and unpredictability uh, that we have not seen for a long time. Can you speak a little bit more to that? Because obviously, in the second invasion of the Iraq war, throughout the UN's history, there have been these moments in time in which there's so much conflict and strife between the various member states. But it does seem that there is a different dynamic in play now that you have a very conservative governments around the world, not only in the United States with the Trump administration, but with Brexit. Various countries have nationalist leaders coming to power. So how have those political dynamics that have been changing in the recent years affecting the United Nations mission? Well, you know, I think you, you, you the, the problem is the unpredictability during the and, and the lack of the shifting alliances, mm -hmm. uh, the lack of clear lines of alliances. I mean, in the run up to the Iraq war, it was very clear. You had the U.S. and U.K. and a couple of other countries on one side. And you had the rest of the world on the other. It was very clear. Mm -hmm. Here, the, the, the lines of alliances are not that clear. Uh, and I will let you know, analysts speak to the reason for it. But it's, it is this uncertainty makes it uh, much more difficult to manage, uh, to manage a global crisis. You know, as, as the Secretary General likes to say, you know, we went from a bipolar world uh, with the U.S. and the Soviet Union to, for a period of time, a unipolar world with the U.S. And now we're sort of a, a multipolar world that is still evolving and has yet to settle. And that's, uh, I think that's where we see, uh, that's where we see danger. The Security Council seemed to have been sidelined initially with COVID. In more recent weeks, they seem to have been gaining some traction and are starting to meet and discuss this. I mean, Why have they been relatively marginalized at the beginning of this crisis? Well, you know, it's not that the Security Council is sidelined. It's the Security Council had yet, has, had yet, has yet to coalesce, right? It's not like the, the most powerful countries in the world are sitting on the Security Council. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not as if they were, the council is a separate entity that's been sidelined. Uh, they have been now, and this is clear from the press reports, they've been negotiating a resolution on having to do with COVID and are having a lot of problems uh, agreeing on language. Well, where do they gain traction? What is their role in this crisis? Well, I mean, they had a role in the Ebola crisis. Uh, through Security Council resolutions, the UN set up a mission uh, to deal with Ebola. There was strong messaging on Ebola. On HIV AIDS, they had a, they had a role. Uh, they were HIV AIDS language was included in all the peacekeeping mandates. Uh, th they have a role because they have a unique uh, position in the global management of, of peace and security. And I think it, it would be a, a very strong positive sign if the Security Council could speak with one voice. The Secretary General has used the, op the, the this crisis, this COVID crisis, to call for a global ceasefire. Right. I mean, his message is simple. Uh, we can't fight wars on two fronts. Right. You have whether it's conflicts in Yemen, in Libya, Syria, Colombia, Philippines, uh, Myanmar. You cannot have if humans keep killing other humans, the virus wins. And so for us to have a strong message of backing from the Security Council, backing this call for a global ceasefire would be a, a great help to the secretary general's efforts. So you had mentioned that the World Health Organization is not exactly at the, the center. I mean, it's, a, it's on the periphery. It's certainly connected to the United Nations. In recent months, they've come under fire of being politically collusive with China. And there's, there's something of a scandal, or at least the accusation of that. Um, how are you managing that? Or is that something well, that's that, not really but, part of your... No, it's, well, it's part of our world, right? The, the, the yeah. World Health Organization is a specialized agency of the UN, which has its own General Assembly, for lack of a better word, which right. th there the World Health Assembly elects the head of the World Health Organization. So the Secretary General has no legal authority or, or any uh, way to influence exactly what happens in WHO. That being said, for us, the WHO should be at the center of the 
scientific and public health response to this crisis. Um, and there will be a time where we will need to look back on how institutions, uh, member states, and other entities uh, dealt with the outbreak of this virus, right? How we saw things, how we interpret. There will be a time for a lessons learned exercise. We do not think that now is that time when we're in the middle of the battle. We think this is the time to support the World Health Organization, to enable it to lead on public health issues and medical issues in giving advice to people, to member states. I mean, the, you know, thousands of WHO staff are on the front lines delivering uh, medical supplies and equipment uh, to developing countries. So there'll mm -hmm. be a time for lessons learned. We just don't think this is the time. When you step back from this and look at the trajectory over the last 15 or 20 years and the time that you've been involved with the UN, what's your analysis of why some of these issues that have previously not really been necessarily politicized? I mean, in the case of HIV, AIDS in the United States with ACT UP and various activist organizations that very much became politicized. But then President George W. Bush had been very active in trying to yep. develop international policy, particularly in Africa with HIV AIDS. So that was not politicized in, in any way and the extent to which the current COVID crisis is being politicized. So over the, the not just necessarily on the specifics of this particular crisis, but how, what's your analysis or explanation for why issues are becoming politicized now in the last dozen years or so? And I think, I think it, it's not I, just- I think yeah. Part of it is these issues are not political in themselves, but they're used as wedge issues, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and they're used as, or hammer issues for one country to go after another. And I think it's, you know, we are, we are still living through uh, the aftermath of the destruction of the Cold War system. You could do, a, a, I think that, that, that is one, one way to, to look at it, where, uh, you know, it has, the, the, the end of that system has enabled democracy to flourish in so many places, has brought freedom to so many people. Um, we've, but it has also unsettled, unsettled things. We have seen the growth of uh, middle powers, which are trying to assert themselves, regional powers, which are trying to assert themselves in a way that they would not have 10, 15, 20 years ago. Do you have any particular nations in mind when you talk about middle powers or regional powers? Well, I mean, if you if you look at uh, uh, if you look at uh, Saudi Arabia, you look at uh, at India, at Pakistan, uh, at uh, at at Brazil, at uh, Korea, uh, and and I and, and this is not a it's not a list of of, of member states that have uh, inserted themselves in 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 or South Africa, Nigeria, uh, Egypt. Th this is not a list of countries that have meddled in a negative way. It's just countries that have grown in stature, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and they have made themselves heard as, as countries should. Uh, but we are still, I think, in, a, in, a, in, an unsettled, in an unsettled period. Well, COVID is certainly right now the issue, the intersection to which all roads seem to be leading. Can you discuss the way in which the United Nations has been responding to this crisis? In terms of so you have different parts of the UN reacting different ways. In terms of WHO, they have since the beginning been in the lead uh, on the public health, and that's where where they where they belong. For the Secretary General, as I said, he has tried to uh, use this opportunity to push for ceasefires in different parts to to redouble our our efforts. Um, we have also. <clears throat> In terms of the immediate reaction, we have activated the UN's global supply chain in support of developing countries, uh, mm -hmm. delivering uh, equipment, delivering supplies, delivering humanitarian uh, workers. Our peacekeeping missions are mobilized in an effort uh, to help prevent the spread of the virus <clears throat> in the countries in which they are they are operating. We have also uh, ensured we are 
putting out policy advice and policy papers on issues such as the economic recovery to make sure that the recovery is not only equitable uh, for people, but is also green, that we should not waste this opportunity and not fight harder for, for climate change. We've highlighted issues uh, such as um, the impact of the, the, the threat to human rights in the COVID response. We've seen uh, civil liberty issues. We've seen issues related to freedom of the press. We've seen a, a tremendous spike in, um, in gender-based violence, where the lockdowns have often forced women and girls to be locked into small spaces with people who are their abusers. So these are issues and, and that we are uh, putting in the forefront for, for policymakers. So we're involved in, 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 in all sorts of of ways, and I think the UN system as a whole has really come um, come together and focused with everyone in their own department, whether it's human rights, whether it's children, whether it's health, uh, to address uh, the current crisis. Mm. Well, these are state level responses that work through institutions. The WHO has referred to COVID as an infodemic; that the saturation of media, including social media, is really unique and unbalancing the way in which people are able to process the information related to this. How has that changing media climate affected the way you do business? This is well, on, yeah. on one, one hand, it's increased the threats to journalists. Right. Uh, and so we're, we're, we're concerned about press freedom. On the other hand, it's also increased, as you say, disinformation and the dangers of disinformation. And mm -hmm. we have been working with social media companies like WhatsApp to help um, spread uh, information uh, and correct information about uh, about the pan the pandemic. You know, we th this crisis came uh, at a time where there are so many social media platforms. There's so many ways of people to spread information and to spread misinformation and disinformation. And that's mm -hmm. that's a threat, and that's something we are focusing on. Well, I had seen this during the Fukushima crisis in Japan the nuclear crisis, where social media started to gain traction. It was the first major nuclear event in which the internet and social media right. was changing the way in which governments dealt with this. So this is something that's been coming for a while. Can you talk a little bit more personally about how the changing media has affected your particular, the way in which you do your job? Well, it's interesting because what I have seen over the last 20 years uh, that I've been uh, doing communications from this end is an increasing uh, speed at which information travels. And so the news cycle goes faster and faster and faster, right? It's no longer a 24-hour news cycle. It could be an hour news cycle or less. And so you have, on one hand, this engine that is spinning at faster and faster speeds all the time. And I connect that engine to the engine of diplomacy, which moves at a much slower and deliberate space. I mean, it moves faster than it used to, but still yeah. at a deliberate pace for very good reasons, right? That, that that's it. takes more yeah. time. And so I sometimes feel like I have smoke coming out of my eyes because <laughs> I'm the transformer that converts, <laughs> you know, the, the, the voltage of diplomacy with the hyper voltage of the news cycle. I don't know. How do you manage the workflow? I mean, what's a day in the life of? Well, it's uh, we'll start by saying it's uh, 10, 10 p.m. Uh, and I'm doing an interview. I still have well, an hour's worth of work. I appreciate you indulging no, this that, response. Well, I know you're very busy. Always happy. Um, so I start my day usually around 530 in the morning. Um, I start to work on a kind of morning headlines document for the secretary general, about 10 pages of top level headlines from around the world uh, that is uh, done by myself and my colleagues. I edit the final version around 7.30. It goes out to the Secretary General and about 3,000 other people within the UN system. I then brief him every morning at, uh, in the morning himself, the deputy, the chief of staff, the senior staff in his personal office, not the heads of department. It's a chance for me to talk to him directly uh, and see what he's thinking and, and what he's doing. I'm not going to ask him what the UN is doing in the Congo at that time, but I will ask him the kind of phone calls he's making. 
He gets briefed by others during this meeting. And then we put together, we do a daily press briefing for the journalists that are here at the UN. And we put it together a bit like a newscast. So we have an editorial meeting. We have one at nine o'clock and one at 10.30. And we go around the table, see what stories do we have for that day. And the, um, the, we put together that newscast by my staff preparing notes for me to read out and also a pile of political, what we call if asked language of questions that will be raised that we have answers to if, we, if they, will, they are raised, but we don't want to be proactive on those. And then I do my press briefing at uh, 12. I, I say what I want to say, and then it's a chance for the journalists to ask questions. We, we very strongly believe in the need for this organization to be as transparent as possible. We are a publicly funded institution. We need to be held accountable. And one way to do that is to, be, is to answer questions from the, uh, from the press. Um, and from uh, then in the afternoon, it's, I mean, when we're in the building, obviously, um, is, is to basically do a lot of bilateral work with the journalists to answer their questions because they will come into my office uh, to talk about stories they're working on that they don't want their competitors to know about. And so I do a lot of off the record work with them. And it's the relationship I have with the UN press corps is one that I'd like to refer as sort of mutually assured destruction, meaning that I have to trust them completely, that if I tell them things off the record, they won't quote me. And they have to trust me completely that if they tell me information, I will not share it with their competitors. And if that trust is willfully broken, it's in, it, it can't be repaired. Obviously, mistakes happen and, and whatever. And then we do a lot of work preparing the travels of the secretary general. Either myself or one of my colleagues will travel with him. Um, and so we do preparation for the trips, interviews, Q&As, talking points. Uh, and right now, this minute, he, the secretary general is very likely to do a press event later this week. So I'm working on his, his talking points. So I get inputs from all sorts of people, and I'm working on putting them together. And then so I, you know, I, I end my day. I try to be asleep by uh, by midnight, uh, and then I start over again. And then, obviously, uh, you know, I do have a I have a wonderful wife, three children, and an amazing dog. So that also takes up a bit of time. That's amazing. How do you stay on top of all this information flow and uh, be able to assimilate it, and then convert that into something in a coherent way where it can be politically actionable? Part of it is right is being able to interpret the diplomatic language to press language. The key part for me is to know little about a lot of issues. So I like to be able to answer two or three questions on just about everything that comes up at the UN, but I don't want to waste my limited memory space with diving too deep into any issue, because mm -hmm. then it's questions that I can pawn them off to somebody else. But I need to be able to handle the first round of questions on just about everything. Now, of course, after 20 years here, there's an accumulated level right. of knowledge that right. you kind of know how to answer uh, questions, but it's a, it's a different, uh, it's a different, mm -hmm. what it's, media, an amazing job. it's an amazing job. I mean, I, well, I love it. What, what media do you consume? What's your sources of information? So uh, I will tell you, I skim and do a very quick read of, I look at, uh, in Asia, I look at the South China Morning Post. I look at the Straits Times. Then I look at the Wall Street Journal or the Washington uh, Post, the New York Times, Politico, both the U.S. and the European uh, edition, uh, the Washington Times, Fox News, uh, New York Times, obviously. Uh, I look at The Guardian, uh, Al Jazeera, uh, Al Arabiya. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, obviously, we're plugged into the wires all the time. So Reuters, AP, AFP, DPA, Kyodo, uh, and we, and then, obviously, I'm on Twitter, looking at Twitter all the time as well. There seems to be an iterative process between what the media is reporting and then what you're later conveying. So in a manner of speaking, there's a kind of conversation that's going back and forth between media reports and the announcements that you're putting forth through the United Nations. It's, 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 a, it's a give and take, right? So there are things we want to talk about and there are things they want to talk about. Our job is to make sure that what we want to talk about is relevant to what is going on. We cannot seem to be tone deaf. Mm -hmm. 
right? So we, there are things that we will need to talk about regardless. But let's say on COVID, we wanted to talk about uh, issues of gender, gender violence, on the climate change, human rights. And so we want to feed into the news cycle as well to make sure that people understand that the UN is relevant. And you're also putting forth your ideals and your values. Together. Exactly, exactly. As I talked to Robert, we were discussing the way in which media has changed. And you know, our, our university has students from some 65 countries. And I know a number of students who are studying journalism, but it seems that every professional journalist that I talk to say that it's, it's a very difficult environment that, you know, the, the transition from print media now to internet and just the cacophony of all these different media sources seems to be a tough time to be a journalist. Can you speak a little bit to, what would you tell a student about yeah, the future a, of journalism as an occupation? It's, it's a, it's two different things. I think it's a tough time to be a journalist because the pay is not good. It's dangerous, uh, but it's a great time for journalism, mm. right? There are a lot of great stories to tell. There's a lot of great investigations to be had. The the cha the question is how do you make it into a, a you know how do you make sure that it is a profession that you can survive in financially. So I think it's two, it's two different things because the, the threshold for how to be a journalist is very low, right? You don't need to, 40 years ago, you needed to work for a, a big news organization for which you got a good salary and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but now it's very easy to be a journalist and to do your own investigations because you have everything at your fingertips. You don't need to go to the library. You can post on your blog. You can do whatever you want. It's difficult to make a living out of it. What's the skill set? I mean, you didn't necessarily come out of a, a journalistic training no. background. I think the skill set, listen, is good communications. It's like for everything, right? You, you need to be able to communicate clearly. You need to be able to write clearly. And you need to be curious. And in your particular position, it seems to be unique because you're, you've been the conduit for these various secretary generals. So you have to both represent your institutional interests, but you also need to be a a kind of proxy voice for these authorities. Right. I mean, so that, that's exactly, I mean, I, 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 rep, I speak on behalf of the secretary general of the institution and I speak on his, uh, his behalf. And I've been fortunate enough that I've never felt that what I was asked to do or say was uh, in contradiction to the ideals of the, uh, uh, of the institution and my own personal ideals. As a working journalist, before you became involved in the United Nations, you had surely a different mode of working. How did you acquire those skills? And as you look back over your time at the United Nations, how have you changed the way in which you do your work? Uh, I think I'm much more careful because you have to understand that, uh, you know, when you're a journalist, if you make a mistake, it can be, it's very serious, right? But you can always correct it in one way or another. Mm -hmm. If if you speak on behalf of an institution like the UN and you make a mistake, it can have real world consequences in terms of uh, negotiations collapsing, people walking away, all, all these things, because it's not you. So you really have to be careful. You mm -hmm. have, mm -hmm. And that's why we move a little slower sometimes. So in addition to the COVID crisis, what issues are you working on now? What are some of the, the things in front of you that are priorities? Um, trying to figure out what my kids are going to do over the summer. <laughs> and you're working from home, right? Yes, working, um, def working, working from home. I go in the office once a week, maybe, but basically working from home. I do the press briefing from home every day. That must be a challenge. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, you know, I mean, everything runs through COVID right now uh, because it impacts climate change, it impacts e e equality, uh, it, it, it impacts uh, the economy, it impacts travel, it impacts everything. Yes, with our podcast here, we've discussed about not becoming so much a prisoner of the moment that the only thing we talk about is COVID, but it seems to be the, you know, the tail that's wagging every dog right now. And it's, it's difficult to talk about anything without talking about COVID. Thank you very much for taking the time. My, Clara, my, my pleasure. Uh, and good luck to, to you and all the best in these, in these difficult times.